Well, welcome paleopedologists. Um, it is time to talk about um, factors in soil formation. So the first part of this course was pretty much a, a basic soil science course in a uh, third of a term. Um, this next third uh, is all about the factors of soil formation. Um, how we know that particular features in soils form from particular environmental variables, which of course is needed for paleosols because what we want to know from the soil is what was the environment like that formed this particular soil. Um, the whole idea of factors in soil formation um, really it goes back uh, to uh, the very um, beginning of soil science, um, which I and uh, many soil scientists uh, think is of Russian origins, and it goes back to this rather monumental uh, monograph of Dokuchev in 1883. What um, Dokuchev uh, figured out was that soils are not just weathered rock. Um, the whole uh, of soil science was not really invented before 1883 uh, because it was just regarded as a branch of geology uh, and it was called um, chemical geology uh, and the idea was to look at the changes in chemical composition of a rock that's exposed to the atmosphere and that is undergoing um, weathering. Uh, what Dokuchev uh, proved was that there was um, something rather special um, about uh, the um, rocks which, or about the soil, which was called uh, Chernitzem, the black earth of Russia, uh, which we now call a molosol, uh, and that uh, the molosol was not just a product of chemical geology, it was a product of a life. It was created by grasslands and earthworms and marmots and ground squirrels. Um, it was a biological um, product. Uh, it was pretty quickly realized um, that life is a very important component to soil formation. But not just life, um, also climate. Uh, the early Russian school of pedology quickly had a idea of uh, zonal soils. At that time, the Chernitzim or Molosol was regarded as a zonal soil of um, temperate uh, mid latitudes. It wasn't until later we found, well, yeah, they can form in the tropics as well. Um, pod soils were regarded as soils of the high northern latitudes and high southern latitudes and high uh, mountains. Um, oxisols uh, were regarded as tropical uh, soils. The whole thing really came to a head um, and was systematized in America by um, Hans Jenny, a Swiss expat um, who was a professor at the University of California, Berkeley, and he wrote a very influential book called Factors in uh, Soil Formation. This was the first quantitative attempt to understand uh, soil formation in terms of its various, uh, various factors. He had a dream of a, a universal soil equation where you could um, have some um, state factor of soil, uh, for example, the amount of clay, uh, the red color um, on, on, a, on a scale of redness to, 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 to uh, blueness. Um, and that um, these various features were a function of um, the various factors, uh, climate, organisms, um, topographic relief, uh, parent material, and uh, time. So this is climate. Uh, this is the zonal soil concept, which was very big in the Russian literature. Uh, these are organisms. Uh, that would be the grasslands and the marmots that are making uh, the molosol. This is uh, relief, uh, which is the landscape uh, position. This is parent material. That is the material that was there to start with because soils develop on either sediments or bedrock. Um, that is a pre-existing material which they 
actually older. And this is the time for formation. That is the duration of soil uh, formation. So that a soil had formed for a relatively short period of time uh, would be not so well developed as one which developed for a long period of, uh, of time. Now, uh, in order to isolate these variables, what you need to have is a set of uh, soils. We use a kind of a, a space for time analogy to do an um, experiment. Um, if you wanted to know, um, get an equation that related to some particular soil feature, to climate, for example, you would try to find a climo sequence. I'll give you an example of this in a bit. Uh, and from that, you would try to get a climo function. A climo sequence is a bunch of soils um, that are different in climate, but comparable in the other state vectors. In other words, they have a different climate, but and uh, but they have uh, very similar organisms, topographic relief, parent material, time for formation. One of the examples that came to him as a young man um, at the International uh, Soil Conference in um, St. Louis, Missouri in um, 1930 um, was the Great Plains of North America, uh, where the climate varies quite a bit from St. Louis, Missouri going out to Denver, uh, and that was the field excursion he was on, but it's all grassland. It's all kind of uh, flat. It has a lucic parent material from the last glaciation, and the time of formation is pretty much less than 13,000 years since the glaciers um, went away. Uh, the idea then is to take some soil feature and make a mathematical relationship between that feature and some climate variable, like mean annual rainfall, for example. A biosequence is um, a sequence of uh, soils um, in the modern environment uh, that can lead to biofunctions. Now, um, the idea that um, climate uh, could not change all that much, but plants could, uh, means that this has to be a fairly local one because you can't go too far or climate will change. Um, the relief and the parent material are not too bad. Uh, and we do see some, some things like this at um, the ecotones between different vegetation types, for example, between, a, between oak hickory forest and grassland in, um, in Illinois. A topo sequence. This is a tough one too. It would have to be on a fairly small scale. Uh, to get topo functions to see the degree to which um, the um, topographic relief uh, changes uh, soil uh, characters. A litho sequence is a set of soils that are carefully chosen to um, give litho functions. So that means they're on different um, parent materials um, that um, are in pretty much the same area for everything else. Um, and what's the difference in the soil uh, feature? And then finally, there's corner sequence. Whoops. To give a chrono function. Um, this is one that um, has been of most interest to geologists because uh, it turns out that if you can tell the age of a soil just by looking at it, um, you're fairly far along to looking at problems of um, earthquakes um, and uplift rates and uh, sea level change and other things of geological interest. It's basically a sequence of soils um, that have a very similar climate, very similar vegetation, very similar topographic relief, very similar parent materials, but different times for formations. I think, for example, of the terraces we find uh, in the coast of Oregon. The whole thing is uplifting. Uh, and so the high terraces are older than um, the low terraces. Uh, it's a similar climate. Uh, it's a similar vegetation, Sitka spruce forest in general. Um, these are uh, the sorts of um, settings where we can start to learn 
about the various features of souls that are largely due to uh, time. Now, um, the ideal situation um, would be uh, for the mathematical function uh, on an xy plot uh, to look like this. That would be great. Because then you can, um, if you have um, a, a factor which you can measure, um, uh, for example, mean annual rainfall, um, you can, it's a relationship between mean annual rainfall and some um, factor in the soil, like depth to carbonate nodules, for example, and, um, and vice versa. So with a, with a relationship like this in the modern environment, uh, we can use that to interpret um, the fossil soil, which is on this side, um, in, uh, and make an inverse function uh, for it. Um, this would be a direct um, relationship. Um, it's also possible um, that uh, certain state factors actually come to a dynamic equilibrium. And that just means that uh, segments of um, the graph are not useful. It's only this segment that's going to be useful. Once you get out here, it loses a lot of its power. Um, and there are other uh, sort of threshold sorts of arrangements where um, it changes slowly, then rapidly, and then um, most likely this is a threshold effect. Um, these sorts of relationships are of limited usefulness for paleopedology um, as well, uh, because it's hard to know when you're near this threshold. Um, it, it, this is the sort of thing that happens, for example, with clay horizons. When clay horizons start to get plugged up, um, then all of a sudden uh, they get more and more uh, plugged. Now, this is a very kind of theoretical look at it. Um, I think it's a, it's a lot more helpful if I give you an actual um, example. And it's the one that Hans Jenny um, himself um, actually um, had. And that is uh, the example of the Great Plains, which I alluded, um, where the depth to the BK horizon, so you've got a profile um, in the Great Plains where you have these nodules. Um, it's a grassland soil, a molosol, an A, B, K. We measure this depth here, um, and um, we do it on a, uh, a climate uh, gradient uh, from uh, 0, 500, um, 1,000. This is um, mean annual precipitation in uh, millimeters. Uh, 1,000 would be um, Chicago or Indianapolis. Uh, 500 uh, would be somewhere in the middle of Iowa or Kansas. Um, out here would be, uh, would be Colorado. Now, um, what uh, Yenny found on his, uh, uh, his amazing geological excursion, and he got pretty excited about this and published it um, when he was working in Columbia, Missouri, um, is that there was a nice relationship. Um, and then later on, um, Rod Arkley um, was studying the really dry soils um, in the Mojave Desert, and he found another relationship like this. It was a bit of an argument. Arkley put a, put a straight line like that. Uh, Yeni put a straight line uh, like that. Um, later on, uh, several of us compiled this thing, and uh, we decided that straight lines weren't going to do it. That's, a, of course, an equation of the form um, y equals mx plus b. Uh, that it's a nonlinear relationship, uh, so that um, you can um, have a um, an equation of p uh, that is uh, precipitation equals one thirty nine point six minus six point three eight eight d minus zero point o one three o three d squared. Um, this has an accuracy of plus or minus 141 millimeters and an R 
uh, uh, of um, a correlation coefficient of uh, 0.779. Now, this is the inverse equation. This is the one that we can use for our paleosol. So if we know the depth of the calcic arising in a paleosol, we can plug in this equation um, and um, get a mean annual uh, precipitation. Um, a very useful piece of information. Pretty big error range, but, you know, not bad for government work. Um, it's better than nothing. Uh, and it is a quantitative graded um, estimate, not just a, a sort of a vague idea of what uh, the climate was uh, like. Uh, there is a possibility of improving it, of course, uh, in taking different subsets of soils that are even more closely defined in terms of the equivalence of their other uh, variables and its comparability uh, to uh, the paleosol. But this one has actually proven to be a pretty functional uh, relationship. Now I want to emphasize that this is the reverse of the way um, I have uh, plotted it. Um, and that is, um, usually we, we, we want y uh, and we are given x. Um, so the prediction for the depth um, with the mean annual precipitation is minus uh, 40.49 minus 0.852 p minus 0.00255 p squared uh, plus or minus 33 centimeters um, and an r equals 0.78. This is the relationship that you would get from the modern, uh, but this is the equation that you need which is the inverse correlation um, in order to uh, figure out what the mean annual precipitation of a, um, of a paleosol was. Another variable um, which has turned out to be really uh, quite uh, useful um, is uh, mean annual range of precipitation. In uh, millimeters uh, mean annual range of uh, precipitation in um, millimeters is the difference between the mean precipitation of the wettest month and the mean precipitation of the driest month through um, the year. And we have these sorts of um, data uh, from um, climate tables uh, and by compiling a whole bunch of um, different um, sorts of soils um, in a fairly well-constrained uh, sort of sedimentary setting with relatively low um, relief, um, we have um, a, a relationship with the thickness of the BTIs. And that is this measure right here. Where do the nodules start in the profile and where do they end? In a highly seasonal climate, um, we have a dry season and a wet season. The dry season is going to be precipitating carbonate out through here. The wet season is going to be dissolving it and forcing it out through here. And as a result, if you have a highly seasonal climate, like the monsoon climate of India, you'll stretch the nodules out pretty much uh, throughout um, the profile. Uh, this turned out to be a pretty nice straight line relationship, um, and uh, it is of this form, m equals 0.79t plus 13.71. Um, the um, uh, plus or minus uh, 22 uh, centimeters is the standard error, and the r squared equals 0.5. Uh, eight. Um, this is a way of getting uh, the relative uh, seasonality uh, of, uh, of climate. Now these are quantitative uh, measures. This one basically just takes off from Hans Jenny's original um, linear um, interpolation. Um, uh, this, is a, this is a new one. We're coming up with these all the time. Um, I like to call them uh, transfer functions.
uh, because um, what they do is they take a feature of the soil, uh, the thickness of the calcic horizon, or the depth to the calcic horizon, and they transfer that into a variable which is of interest, a paleoclimatic variable of interest, uh, such as mean annual precipitation um, and mean annual range of uh, precipitation. This is a considerable um, improvement on the old-fashioned way of doing it. Um, in um, 1929, uh, Marbot, uh, uh, who did the first um, big soil survey of um, the United States, um, had the idea that you could divide uh, North American soils um, into um, pedocals and pedalphas. Uh, the boundary between them, these are the ones that have carbonate in the profile, BK horizons, these are the ones that do not. The boundary shifts a little, it's about 600 millimeters um, of um, mean annual precipitation down here on the Gulf Coast and about 500 um, millimeters uh, mean annual precipitation up here um, in Wisconsin and uh, Minnesota. But that's kind of a very general guide, isn't it, to climate, whether you're dealing with a climate which is uh, relatively humid and therefore all the carbonate is actually taken out of the soil or leached out, or whether you're dealing with one which has an excess of evaporation of a precipitation, allowing um, the um, accumulation of, um, of, uh, of carbonate. Um, seasonality um, is um, here a, a, a feature which is from the uh, thickness of the, um, of the soil uh, carbonate horizon. But there are other indications of seasonality as well. Um, that are actually observable uh, in, uh, in power sites. I've talked about one of these already, um, and that is this rather ra remarkable um, feature that we see um, in vertisols, where you have the slick and sided lentil pads. and the cracks. Um, and in a fossil example, uh, we can actually often see these cracks preserved. Um, and the, 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 this, this is what's called Mukara structure. And this relief, this surface relief, which is also preserved in the rock record, is called Gilgai micro-relief. I've talked about this before. Um, this is a sort of an overall guide to seasonality, not a quantitative one, like the um, degree uh, to which the uh, carbonate horizon is spread out through the profile, uh, but it's nevertheless a very effective one. Uh, if this structure is really well developed, um, then that means that there's quite a strong uh, seasonality. It's actually kind of surprising to me that nobody has tried to quantify this in terms of the depth of the cracking uh, within the profile. Um, we have other indications of seasonality too, concretions. Um, in soil science um, and in paleopedology, um, we like to make a distinction between nodules and concretions. Uh, nodules are um, massive. Uh, concretions are concentrically um, banded. Um, usually it's uh, banded with ferric material, with iron oxides. Uh, sometimes it can alternate with carbonate, with calcite. In super strongly seasonal climates, um, in the monsoonal climates of India, for example, um, where the uh, calcic horizons are almost a meter thick, um, and uh, they dry out and are completely parched in the dry season. And then there's this deluge um, of rainfall, as in that wonderful uh, movie, Monsoon Wedding. Uh, we find um, actually alternating carbonate from the dry season and uh, ferric uh, bands uh, in the concretions 
uh, from the wet season, um, these are pretty good, uh, good guides to uh, seasonality. Another guide to seasonality is root traces. Um, in seasonal climates, um, there will be um, a bimodal distribution of roots. And there'll be some um, roots near the surface. Uh, and then there will be sinkers. The roots near the surface are from the growth of material in the, the wet season uh, and the um, the sinkers are from the perennial trees largely uh, that go down to the retreating uh, water table during the dry season. Uh, these surface root traces are largely um, annual plants uh, that uh, become quite abundant and then uh, and then uh, disappear uh, as the dry season advances. Uh, clay mineralogy. Um, spectites are dry in a dry climate. Kaolinite in a wet climate. Uh, this has been sort of quantified. Um, there are indications from soils of Hawaii, for example, uh, that um, these, this transition um, has a uh, particular mean annual rainfall uh, that, uh, that controls it. Evaporites. One of the main evaporites uh, in um, uh, soils is gypsum. Uh, which is CASO4.2H2O. Um, and these, uh, these form um, desert roses of lath like crystals uh, that are basically sand crystals, uh, desert roses. Um, unlike evaporites that form in the ocean or in lagoons or in uh, Playa Lakes at the bottom of Death Valley, uh, these do not form in saturated conditions. They form in dry soils, and the gypsum forms a cement around the individual grains of the soil. Um, it's a it's a, it's what's called a sand crystal, very distinctive uh, form uh, that is replacive, not displacive, uh, because in unsaturated materials, in dry materials. The force of crystallization cannot force the grains apart. It just grows around them in optical continuity. That's really a wonderful thing about one of these gypsum crystals. It is a single gypsum crystal, but it's just got lots of sand grains and silt grains embedded um, within it. Uh, there's another equation we have, and I won't bore you with the math, um, that relates the depth to the gypsum uh, to mean annual precipitation. Um, in the same way as um, we have a, an equation for the depth to the calcic horizon itself. Um, if you have a, a gypsic and a calcic horizon in the same uh, paleosome, um, then um, we have a, um, it's almost always that the gypsic horizon uh, is deeper within the profile. Gypsum is a much more soluble material uh, in the rain uh, than uh, is uh, than is calcium. Uh, temperature. Uh, we have some chemical ways of getting at temperature. None of them all that good, um, based on the uh, chemical uh, degree of um, weathering of materials um, in the hydrolysis equation. I won't go there. I'll just give you some sort of general ideas about how we can get an idea of, uh, of temperature. Um, it, 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 in, the, in the tropical climate regime, um, something that is um, very common in tropical soils are spherical microkids. These are rounded, opaque clay materials. Uh, they are 10 to 100 microns 
in uh, diameter. And we know how they form. They form uh, by the oral and fecal action of um, termites. Termites uh, round these up within their jaws with their saliva, um, and they also poop them out. Um, the ones they poop out tend to be uh, tend to be kind of hexagonal because of the flaps um, of uh, the tergites around their anus. Um, but um, tropical soils are absolutely full of these things, and that's because um, ground dwelling termites are um, found completely within the thirty uh, degrees centigrade isotherm in tropical um, regions. We have termites in temperate regions too, but they're all inside houses that are kept relatively uh, warm. Uh, termites uh, do not do well um, in temperate climates where there's a freeze. In fact, they can't stand a freeze at all. They can't live out of doors uh, in that kind of environment. Uh, in tropical regions, it's very hard to keep any kind of wooden structure uh, from being completely destroyed uh, by by termites. In some places in Western Australia it's so bad uh, that you can't have wooden fence posts. Uh, everything has to be uh, has to be metal. Um, tropical soils, oxysols in particular, are full of these things and they preserve really quite nicely. Um, it's basically um, Fe2O3 and Al2O3 um, these as oxides, deeply weathered clays which are strongly um, ferruginized. Uh, and that's in part because termites have um, ultra alkaline um, guts. They are really good at digesting things. Cast. Um, we have quite a few examples of, um, of uh, paleocast uh, in the rock record. Uh, and these are the sorts of places where we have a limestone um, which has been um, eroded, dissolved by carbonic acid um, in the soil, uh, producing these narrow uh, slots. Which are called dolines. Narrow slots and caves are found in temperate climates. But in tropical climates, um, we have something quite different. In tropical climates, um, the limestone is dissolved into these stunning uh, towers. This is uh, tower, tower cast, uh, which is a tropical phenomenon. You have seen beautiful pictures of these, I'm sure. In uh, Chinese watercolors, uh, those remarkable watercolors um, from uh, China, which go well back into classical times, um, illustrate these remarkable towers of uh, limestone. They're particularly common in South China. Many of them are actually fossilized. Uh, many of them are actually Permian in age. We find them also uh, in limestones in uh, Sumatra and Java, uh, in Indonesia. And we find them in the fossil record going way, way back, including in North America in Pennsylvanian age when uh, tower cast of um, Illinois. Uh, these uh, tower casts reflect deep tropical weathering of uh, limestone um, into these uh, rather amazing uh, 50 to um, meters or so um, towers. And then at the other extreme, there's permafrost features. <coughs> uh, permafrost features are really pretty diagnostic of different sorts of permafrost climates, different degrees of, of freezing and uh, thawing. Um, one type um, is a, um, a structure which is a very big, wide wedge. Pretty typically they're in tillites or gravelly rocks, but they have quite a wide V shape. This is called an ice wedge. We find a lot of these um, in the maritime glacial climate of the Alaskan North Slope still forming. It's still ice here. 
Uh, but of course, in the fossil record, when the ice melts, what happens is sediment just comes and fills in that hole. Uh, the ice is it has has precipitated in a crack. It's expanded and expanded and expanded and makes these really quite amazing um, ice wedges. Uh, this is typically a meter or more. Um, it's similar, I suppose, to a mud crack, uh, but it has a very different origin. A mud crack is just where clay uh, dries out and it makes these um, wedge-shaped structures. Mud cracks are not nearly so wide, however. This really um, wide uh, kind of a feature uh, is characteristic of ice wedges and of a paraglacial uh, climate. Another um, common one um, in the fossil record um, is um, a situation which is distinguished as not an ice wedge, but a sand wedge. Um, there's bedding on top here, but the difference is that it's filled with disturbed material, uh, which is more or less um, vertically um, arranged. Um, these sand wedges form under much more arid continental glacial conditions. Sand wedges are currently best understood from the dry valleys of Antarctica. And what's happening is there's been freezing and thawing activity allowing sediment to get down um, into the crack um, in um, various episodes of freezing and uh, thawing. Uh, the ice formation is wedging that material, squeezing it up, squeezing it down, um, and then um, holes that emerge from the melting of the ice allow material to fall down to form a sand, uh, a sand wedge. These are uh, from a continental paraglacial climate like those of Antarctica. Uh, these are from a maritime paraglacial climate like those of the Alaskan North Slope. And we actually find both of these in the fossil record going way, way back. Um, in fact, um, these are um, some of the lines of evidence that we use uh, for understanding uh, Snowball Earth, a period of time um, about uh, six to seven hundred million years ago uh, when most of the Earth froze. And these kinds of paraglacial features are found even close uh, to the equator. I've documented them, for example, from the Snowball Earth time um, on the rock platforms around Adelaide uh, in South Australia. Now, finally, um, we have, um, there's, there's a lot of math involved um, in um, these different uh, climber functions. But um, one that I think is particularly ingenious and is worth going into um, quite a bit um, is a, a paleobarometer of um, carbon dioxide. Uh, this is um, a kind of a model-based um, way of um, looking um, at ancient CO2 in the atmosphere by the chemical study of, um, of paleosols. Um, basically, um, it uses um, these um, calcareous paleosols. This is our grassland soil again. Uh, with an A and a BK um, horizon. And what we're interested in um, is the isotopic composition of the carbon um, in the carbonate uh, itself. So the isotopic composition of the carbonate is the 13C of a uh, sample. which equals the um, 13 uh, C over 12 C of the sample over the 13 C over 12 C of a standard uh, which is P.D. Bellumnite, um, that's a calcareous fossil from the Cretaceous, minus one uh, and times a thousand, um, so that this uh, number is 
per mil per mil not per million per mil um, this means uh, per thousand now we have to blow the numbers up because they're rather small um, the amount of C13 is a very tiny compared to the amount of C12 um, and it gives us a fairly characteristic scale um, where the PD belemnite is zero and that's the ancient ocean uh, condition it's actually a Cretaceous fossil um, and uh, it gives us a scale uh, which goes from about 10 to um, minus 20 now um, the composition, the isotopic composition of carbon in the atmosphere um, is um, around about uh, here. It's about minus minus five or so. But what happens in the soil um, is that it readily changes in its isotopic uh, composition. Uh, this is the carbon CO2. Um, this is del 13C in uh, per mil um, measured in a mass spectrometer from the ratio of the 12 to 13 uh, carbon. Now why it goes south, why it goes negative here um, is because the soil itself is respiring. The plants themselves have an enzyme called rubisco and these plants actually are changing the isotopic composition of carbon which they incorporate in their bodies by about 20 per mil. That is a huge, huge difference. So the isotopic composition of the carbon in the plant is about minus 25 with respect to the standard. Uh, and when the plant's um, roots die and the bacteria eat that material and then produce CO2 in the soil, that CO2 in the soil um, is isotopically depleted to about minus 15 or so. Uh, that um, isotopic value is then transferred uh, to um, the nodules where it is preserved in, uh, in paleosols. Now it depends a lot on the soil respiration. Um, you can have a very highly productive soil uh, in which there's a lot of respired CO2 and the heavy um, oxygen, the heavy carbon from the atmosphere is now overwhelmed by the light carbon from soil respiration. Or you can have this kind of intermediate sort of uh, relationship. Um, this difference here between this and this uh, and the organic material in the soil um, gives us um, the uh, atmospheric uh, composition of um, the atmospheric concentration of uh, carbon dioxide. The equation is complicated, but I want to just go through some elements of it. PA, this is the CO2 in atmosphere. Um, equals PR, that is the respired CO2, times del 13CS, that is the soil value. So that's something you can analyze um, in, the, um, in the nodules of the soil minus 1.0044 del 13 CR, that is the respired value, minus 4.4 over del 13 CA, that is the atmospheric value, minus del 13 C S. This is the soil one. These are um, the two uh, sets of, um, of values. The concentration um, of the 
um, CO2 um, in the atmosphere can now be um, estimated uh, from um, the isotope from from the amount of respired CO2 uh, and the isotopic compositions of the soil of the respired CO2 in the soil and of the atmosphere. Um, we have ways of um, getting at all of these um, the variables and I won't go through them all uh, because I see uh, time um, is, is, is short um, but uh, it turns out um, that um, this one is the straight measurement. That's a straight measurement. Um, this one we can actually figure out um, because um, we can also analyze the organic matter. Uh, this one also we can analyze from organic matter. We have another function, um, other functions that can calculate the amount of respired. If we have a bit of organic matter in the soil as well, uh, we can uh, calculate what the organic composition um, was and what the respired organic isotopic composition is going to be in that uh, in that soil. Uh, from the organic matter, we can also calculate how much was in the atmosphere because the um, isotopic fractionation by photosynthesis is a set value, which is well known, uh, and it's temperature dependent, but we can get temperature measurements as well. Um, it's all a little bit um, complicated, but um, it works really uh, surprisingly, uh, surprisingly well. And it's been done going way, way uh, back in um, geological uh, time. We have other ways of getting at CO2 as well. Um, another uh, way of getting at CO2 is from stomatal index. Uh, particularly of fossil ginkgo leaves. Uh, this is something that I've been doing in, in, in my lab quite a bit. Uh, we can look at the proportion of uh, stomates, which are the breathing pores on the surface of the leaf, um, with respect to this. So this is a stomate here. This is an epidermal cell. Uh, when plants have a lot of uh, CO2 in the atmosphere, they put out fewer stomates. They're quite remarkably well adjusted that way. Um, and this um, is a, uh, a way of quantifying CO2 if you have fossil plants. Um, it's nice to have both, though. It's nice to have both uh, because um, these calculations are complicated. Both of them are quite, uh, quite complicated. The bottom line, and it's all starting to come into focus uh, now, um, is that um, we are, of course, very concerned about the rise in uh, CO2 uh, through time. 280 ppm of CO2 is pre-industrial. Uh, we know that this was the case because we've been able to analyze the CO2 in Antarctic cores. And we have records of the CO2 increase uh, through time uh, from um, instruments on the top of Mauna Loa Volcano in Hawaii and a network of other CO2 measuring stations. Um, just last week, um, CO2 at Mauna Loa um, became, reached a peak of 421 uh, ppm. Um, and this is worrisome because it's, it's getting to be um, quite a bit more uh, than the pre-industrial level, um, which of course controls the greenhouse effect and the climate to which we have become um, accustomed. Um, both the um, barometer here from paleosols and from uh, stomatal index are starting to indicate uh, about 600 ppm was um, what we get in the middle Miocene. effectively a doubling of the pre-industrial level. Um, what was it like in the Middle Miocene in Oregon? Well, different, really different. Um, what we have in the Middle Miocene in Oregon are these uh, bauxites that form in the Salem Hills, indicating tropical forests moved north into the Willamette Valley. Tropical forest, not oak savanna, tropical forest. In inland Oregon, instead of aridosols, instead of desert soils, um, we had alpha soils um, and oak forests. Uh, we know this from paleobotany and also from the paleosols out there. 
um, this is a uh, situation uh, that is very different from the alkali flats and the dusty open plains of Oregon uh, today, of eastern Oregon today. In the Permian-Triassic boundary, the world's greatest mass extinction I've been able to estimate uh, from this paleobarometer that the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere reached 2,500 parts per million. That's really extraordinary. That's like a tenfold increase. Pretty close to a tenfold increase. It was a, a transient increase, um, but it had a disastrous effect. Um, about 90% of uh, all the creatures on Earth became extinct. The oceans went stagnant. The coral reefs disappeared. Um, there were no corals forming uh, in peat swamps for about 5 million years or so. This was a disaster. So these quantitative estimates, as rough as they are, um, from two different um, approaches are giving us a pretty fundamental understanding on the greenhouse uh, effect in the past. Um, should we panic when we get to 421? Well, not really. We should a little, be a little concerned when we get to 600, and that could happen as soon as the end of the century. But if you go over 2000, then suddenly ecosystems collapse, and they collapse globally, and they collapse catastrophically, and it takes millions of years um, to get them back. Uh, paleosols are uh, now front and center in trying to figure out um, what the worst effects of uh, a greenhouse crisis might be in the history of the world. And that'll do it for the moment. Um, next time, uh, we'll get on to...